Hey everybody, Alexa here and welcome to Murder on the Mountains. We are back. It was almost three months. Time just flies and is crazy. But we are back and Megan is going to take on our case this week. Hello. So this week's case takes place in Columbia, South Carolina. On June 24th, 2002, 15-year-old Kara Robinson was hanging out at her friend's house. She was helping her friend out around the house and decided to go out front and water some plants while her friend was taking care of some things inside. So while watering the plants, a man came up behind her and began talking to her about some magazines that he was selling. Next thing she knew, he was holding a gun to her back and forcing her into a plastic container in the back seat of his car. This was in broad daylight like literally just the middle of the day which is super ballsy and i wasn't expecting that i thought you were gonna say he just forced her into the back of his car but then you said plastic container which is horrifying yeah so shortly after kara's friend realized she was gone so she immediately called kara's mom who then called the police but it was too late Kara's abductor had already taken her to his apartment and nobody had seen anything, so the police really had nothing to go on. Which, I mean, I guess people are at work during the day, you know, but still in like the middle of the day in a neighborhood, that's pretty crazy. So once at his apartment, the man began to drug and sexually assault Kara for hours. In an effort to survive, Kara made conversation with her captor and even offered to help around his house. So, while sweeping the kitchen, Kara made note of the magnets on his fridge, the dentist and doctor that he went to, and even memorized their phone numbers. She kept notes of the kinds of animals that he had, how many, and even the serial number of the plastic container that she was held in. Wow. She's amazing to think of all of that, especially the serial number on the plastic container. Also, if he was drugging her, I'm surprised she had, like, the wherewithal to think of all of those things. Do you know what he was writing her with or no? I am not entirely sure. No. I do know that he made her like smoke weed and stuff, but that wouldn't do enough to, you know, incapacitate her. So the abuse that she suffered wasn't just sexual. Her captor also abused her psychologically by making her watch news stories about her abduction, like showing her that people were looking for her, but nobody would ever find her that's horrible um was this an apartment you said just or a house yeah so it wasn't like an apartment complex like outdoor apartments it was kind of like the house kind of like a townhouse but smaller if that makes sense yeah i was just trying to figure out like other people around but that's horrible to have to watch that and but it would also give me hope because then I would be like, maybe his mental state is no one's looking for you. But I would be like, they are looking for me. It's already on the news because sometimes it doesn't make the news. Yeah. And a lot of times like kidnappers and stuff would be like, nobody's looking for you. Nobody even cares. You know, so it's interesting that he was like, look, all these people are looking for you, but nobody's ever going to find you. Exactly. Because I've heard the ones where they're like, it hasn't even been on. No one cares. But I'm like, well, this is a weird spin. That would give me a little bit of hope. Like, oh, it made the news. Cool. So Kara was repeatedly raped and drugged for 18 hours until her captor decided it was time for bed. So he tied her to the bed next to him and he fell asleep. It was at this time that Kara knew that if she was going to live, this was her chance. She was able to wiggle out of her restraints and she bolted out of the apartment. In the parking lot, she saw two men in a car and flagged them down and told them to take her to the police station. So once there, Kara was able to tell the police where the apartment was, what kind of car he drove, and all the details that she had somehow memorized during the most traumatic experience of her life. And they didn't believe her. <laughs> Wrong. So police immediately went to the apartment and of course the man who abducted Kara, who police identified as Richard Evanitz, was gone. He had fled once waking up and realizing that Kara had escaped. 
this story just feels too easy. That's why I thought, oh, the cops aren't going to believe her. I'm like, we just started. So I don't know where this is going. I guess maybe the fact that he's gone, which really, really sucks. But I heard a case before where the woman like ran and got away and the cops didn't believe her. So I thought that's where we were going here as well. But I'm glad that they did. Yeah, luckily that is not the case here. So now that we know the identity of the kidnapper, let's learn a little bit about him. So Richard Mark Edward Evanitz was born on July 29th, 1963 in Columbia, South Carolina to Joseph and Tess Evanitz. He was the oldest of three children and the only son. After he graduated from high school, Richard joined the Navy where he served for eight years before being honorably discharged and receiving a good conduct medal. Once he was out of the Navy, he began working for a company that sold compressors and other equipment. In 1996, his eight-year marriage to his wife Bonnie came to an end, and only a year later he filed for bankruptcy and his house was foreclosed on in 1999. But all of that did not stop him from finding love again. He was married to his second wife, Hope, in 2002 and was still married at the time of the abduction. So if you're thinking this guy seems normal enough, how did he end up kidnapping a girl? That is what I'm thinking. I'm like, what is the plot twist on this one? Not that I want there to be if it's 18 hour rape is horrible enough. But yeah, it all seems very random and strange. So his first recorded offense was in January of 1987 when he was arrested for exposing himself and masturbating in front of a 15 year old girl. He pled no contest and was sentenced to three years probation. And when police searched his apartment after Kara led them there, they found evidence that Kara wasn't his first kidnapping victim. She was also lucky to be alive. Based on evidence found at his home, police were able to connect Richard to the abduction and murders of three girls in Virginia. Megan's jaw just dropped. On September 9th, 1996, 16-year-old Sophia Silva was doing her homework on her front porch. Her plan was to do her homework with her older sister, Pam, but she went out on the porch before her while her sister was still inside. After Pam called out for Sophia from the house multiple times with no answer, she walked outside and her sister was nowhere to be seen. Her homework and soda were right where she had left it. So very similar abduction, like one girl inside, one girl outside, right from the yard. Correct. Broad daylight. Once again, so Sophia was a kind hearted all around good kid who wouldn't just sneak off. So her sister knew something was up and immediately called their parents who turned around and reported her missing to the police. Even though they considered her a missing person, they didn't suspect foul play. So police didn't wait and they still organized search parties that included scent dogs. But they still could not find Sophia. For weeks, volunteers and police searched for Sophia. Unfortunately, a month after her disappearance, a body was found wrapped in a blue blanket with purple nail polish on her fingers and toenails floating in a stream nearby, and her family knew it was her. According to the autopsy, she had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death just days before her body was found, suggesting she had been held captive for days prior to her death. It just sucks. That's really scary because... If she didn't make a move when she did, he would have killed her for sure. Exactly. And in the beginning of the investigation, detectives were appointed to a 44-year-old named Carl Roosh who had an interest in Sophia that was not reciprocated. Obviously, she was a teenager. And he was seen talking to her on multiple occasions. In addition to this, Carl had a rap sheet that included indecent exposure but and also just like a few traffic incidences. Police also found hairs, blue fibers, and a purple flake in Rusha's van that appeared to be a match to similar fibers found on Sophia's body. Based on this, police arrested Carl for Sophia's murder. Oh no, but what are the chances two creeps are like creeping on you? That's terrible. And, but I wonder if he did have his fibers like more stalker vibes, obviously didn't kill her. Yeah. So he was, while he was awaiting trial, two more girls in the same area went missing. On May 1st, 1997, 15 year old Kristen Lisk and her 12 year old sister Katie were abducted from their front yard after getting home from school. 
Their typical routine included calling their father when they got home, but when he didn't receive a call and there was no answer from his calls, he left work early to go check on the girls. When he arrived home, he found the girls' school items on the front lawn and he immediately called the police to report them missing. So this was another kidnapping in broad daylight with no witnesses. And two. Yeah. I thought he was waiting for like one to go inside because it's easier, but maybe it was just convenience. Like he's praying and looking and both of them happen to be out there. That's crazy. Two is crazier to get during the day because one, I could see being scared and being quiet because he has a weapon, but it seems like two would be just, there. Would, it feels like there would be screaming. It's crazy that it's during the day. He did probably also have a gun like he did with Kara. So, you know, I feel like you could easily be like, if you make a noise, I'm going to shoot your sister, like only have the gun on one of them and then scare the other one into submission, basically. That's true. And they're young. That's true. So the girl's father, Ron, organized searches and handed out posters. But just like Sophia, the girls were found dead in a river 40 miles away from their home. They were found only four days after their disappearance. Autopsies show that they had been killed by strangulation shortly after their abduction and had also been sexually assaulted. Due to the similarities between the Lisk sisters and Sophia, police took a second look at Carl Roosh. After they reevaluated the evidence, it was discovered that there had been multiple errors in the lab work and the evidence found against Carl actually did not match what was found on Sophia and the charges were dropped. So they literally had an innocent man in custody and only because two more girls were murdered did they realize he didn't do it. Well, he doesn't sound like a murderer, but he still sounds like a creep. Not that he should be pinned for the murders, but because he still had a public indecency, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm glad they actually looked and reevaluated it because a lot of the times when they already have someone like that, they don't take another look. So, I mean, good for him because he didn't murder anyone. So, with Carl Roosh off the hook, police had to start from scratch. Unfortunately, there were no witnesses and every tip they got or lead they followed came up empty. And they had a lot, like 11,000 leads, and they tested DNA against 400,000 felons and nothing. That was until Kara Robinson escaped years after the murders of his other victims and led police right to Richard Evidence's door. It was years after, so do you think he took some sort of sabbatical or whatever? I hate to say sabbatical from your rate, but you what do they call it when criminals... Like a cooling off period? Yeah, that's been... Do you think he took like a holiday... I was like, wait, that sounds awful. But yeah, a cooling off because that's a really long time or maybe there's just more. They don't they haven't connected or something. Yeah, there could definitely be more, but it was like five years. So it was definitely a good span. So they found a lockbox that included maps of the road leading to the Lisk home newspaper clippings about the crimes and a note seemingly referring to the Lisk sisters that read, 11 or 12, the other 14 or 15, brunettes. Very cute. So he was obviously stalking them. It was premeditated because he had maps leading to their house. It was obviously not just like he was trolling the streets, looking for... He obviously stalked them if he's making notes about them. And then he saw his opportunity and he took it. That's very scary because I really, really thought it was like a convenience because some of them troll and look, but that's almost, it's all bad. There's no way it could be worse, but that's why there were probably no witnesses because it sounded very, very planned. Maybe he watched them for days and realized the best, like the optimal time to when no one was around, which is really creepy. So additional evidence was the furry handcuffs that Kara was still wearing when she got to the police station matched fibers on Kristen, Katie, and Sophia. Fibers from the trunk of Richard's car and also blankets found at his house also tied him to all three murders. So I just, as soon as I read that about the handcuffs that Kara was still wearing, like for her to find that out is just like... 
03 girls were probably murdered while wearing these handcuffs. And now, like, here I am. So it's just, it's just a crazy thought. When he fled his home, Richard made a call to one of his sisters and confessed to committing, in quotes, more crimes than he can remember. Tips led police to Florida where they found Richard who led them on a high-speed chase. When he was surrounded, Richard shot himself before police could arrest him. When Kara found out her captor had committed suicide, she was pissed. She wanted a chance to confront him. She wanted a chance to tell him that she had outsmarted him. And she wanted to let him know that choosing her was the worst mistake of his life. She's awesome because she's 15, right? Yes. She was very smart. She was very, I like the serial numbers and stuff I would have never thought of because they can look up that stuff. And when people buy, she, maybe she was into true crime. I don't understand it. But, and then to be 15 and want to face him, because a lot of people, even grown women are like scared when they have to go to court and face him. But I'm also pissed when you said that. I hate when they cop out and it sounds like he had a normal life and he probably would have been in, embarrassed for everybody to know that he's really a freaking monster and also going back to the handcuffs it's so disgusting and disturbing that all those years later there were still like remnants of the other girls that's ugh, horrible you know what else is crazy that his wife was at disney world with family while all this was going on so she's over there in the happiest place on earth and her husband's back home kidnapping raping and trying to murder girls and i wonder why he didn't go but maybe he made some excuse so that he could do just that like oh you guys go because why wouldn't he even be there well because he's a freaking loser creep that's crazy, though. It still sounds like he had this double life and kind of kept this apartment on the side. He probably had a house with his wife. He probably lived with his wife. No, the house that he took the girls to was his home with his wife. And Kara made a note. She's like, "Um, there's another toothbrush here. There's tampons under the sink. Like a woman lives here. But she never saw a woman. Oh, it's just because they were away. God, I'd be pissed. I would be so pissed. I would be. I would be mad if I. <laughs> I'm sorry. I would be mad if I was the wife too, because that leaves her no closure. Imagine finding out your husband's this disgusting human being. You're automatically going to believe like that's not true. Like when you when people hear that, they're like, "No, there's no way that can be true." And then he kills himself, so you don't even get to ever. That's a lot at once because you're mourning your husband at the same time you're finding out he's a monster. I don't even know how to comprehend that. So Kara ended up joining the police force and she married a cop and she is like an advocate for, you know, sexual assault survivors, victims, um, and shares her story. She has a blog. She's sharing her story and it's incredible she's just you know sharing tips encouraging others and just being an advocate for all things and using her story for good would you be able to link her stuff in your show notes i can yes and i will that would be cool yeah she's awesome and it's always interesting to me when people go through these horrible things and are assaulted and then they go on to become like i've heard ones where they go on to become detectives or something and I'm like I feel like I would crumble and die but maybe <laughs> maybe I'd be stronger than I think but I'm just always so impressed by the ones who like go on and do amazing things she sounds really awesome she is really awesome do you have any final thoughts or comments to this really great survival story and like literally she was pretty much the only reason this man was even like caught because they had no leads. She literally survived and saved, however, you know, who knows how many other girls. I mean, he killed himself, but essentially bringing them to justice, you know? Yeah, and it was, it's not even that. It's a, it was a cold case. It was five years later that, like, he would have potentially, and it's crazy. I really wish I could know, but I guess we'll never know if there were more victims. Five years is a really long time to, like, um, fight that urge 
and then you do it again. But if that was really like he stopped, then it's karma that he got this girl. Like, and that's how he got caught. And I'm, I feel sorry that she had to go through that. But it almost feels like he would have been scot-free if it hadn't been her. Exactly. So if you have no other comments, um, I will post photos and everything on our Instagram and Facebook page. As usual, I will link in the show notes, um, links to all of Kara's things and come back next week for another episode of Murder in the Mountains. See ya. (laughs) 